The Greek capital lies in the southern part of the country, where the Peloponnesus meets Attica. Visiting the sun-drenched landscapes of Hellas is in fact a pilgrimage to the beginnings of European culture. The ruins of Athens' ancient temples, palaces, and forts are more than just crumbling heaps of stones. They're tangible reminders of Greek cultural heritage, not only in sculpture and architecture, but in linguistics, science, politics, and sports. The world as we know it has a thousand links to ancient Greece. This is the birthplace of democracy, the first Olympic Games, and of hundreds of concepts and words that all European languages use to this very day. The ancient ideal of beauty and perfect sense of proportion still leave us spellbound as we gaze upon their often fragmented sculptures. Philosophy, literature, theater, and the science of history all have their roots in ancient Athens. The best-known feature of the city is the Acropolis, crowned by the gleaming pillars of the Parthenon. This majestic complex of buildings was built on a hilltop 156 meters high. On its southern slope, we find the remains of two ancient theaters, the Theater of Dionysus and the Odeon of Herod Atticus. The Baule Gate, leading to the Propyleum, was named after the archaeologist Ernest Baule, who discovered the gate beneath a Turkish bastion. The two rocky towers were originally erected in Roman times and expanded later by the Turks. The line of stairs is divided by a terrace. The marble covering of the stairs has now been reconstructed. Earlier, tourists suffered 60 to 70 accidents a year climbing the stairs. The Odeon was built by a wealthy and famous patron of Athens in memory of his deceased young wife, following the standards of Roman theatre design. This theatre, once very ornate and covered in marble, could accommodate 6,000 spectators. Its remains had been painstakingly restored, and the Odeon now hosts the Athens Festival every September. Left of the terrace stands a huge column. The marble memorial was erected in the 2nd century BC to honor Ipsius Agrippa, son-in-law of Emperor Augustus. The almost 9 meter high base once supported a four-horse war chariot in bronze, but that has been lost. The Propyleum is the entrance to the Acropolis, an ornate gateway, a fitting overture to the fantastic sight that awaits us. It was commissioned by Pericles and designed by Phidias, but construction started under the direction of Menescles after Pericles left Athens. The 18 meter wide and 24 meter long Propyleum is divided into three halls by ionic columns. It originally had a coffered ceiling, which was destroyed by an explosion in Turkish times. It does exist, and it's just like we were taught at school, exclaimed Sigmund Freud when he first saw the Parthenon. This sanctuary is not only the defining feature of the Acropolis, it's irrefutably the principal achievement of the classical world, and owing to its sculptural decorations, a singular representative of the Phidian style. The construction of this Greek temple of perfect beauty started in 447 BC, under the direction of Ictinos and Callicrates. This was the first Greek building to be constructed entirely of marble. The sculptural decorations were made by Phidias, the greatest artist of the time. The colonnade rests on a limestone foundation and measures 70 by 31 meters. The 46 Doric columns are 10.5 meters tall, and the center of the tympanum is a further 5 meters above the foundation. The colonnade once housed Phidias's masterpiece, the gigantic statue of Athena Parthenos. The statue was sculptured in honor of the victory at Marathon and was destroyed during the Venetian Crusaders' ruthless campaign. An excellent copy remains in Bologna today, and a smaller scale copy is displayed at the National Museum in Athens. There is a place where perfection exists. Pentelic marble is a manifestation of the ideal material form. So wrote Jules Renan. It seems the entire temple is singing, enthused Gerda. Here, 
one truly realizes what art is, and the soul cannot help drawing a parallel between works of architecture and works of poetry, said the German writer Emmanuel Gebel. From Herodotus to Chateaubriand and Byron to Herderlin, few writers missed to enthuse about the Acropolis and the Parthenon. We in the 20th and 21st centuries are left with the naked skeleton of the columns. We have to make use of the remaining paintings, drawings, and sculpture fragments to help us imagine its former glory. The gleaming marble of the floors, the color of its friezes, tympanums and rosettes, the sparkle of bronze garlands and gilded shields in the sunlight. In the modern age, reconstruction of the Parthenon began with the re-erection of the colonnade, which partially collapsed in the 1894 earthquake. In the spring of 1905, the International Congress of Archaeologists held its opening session here. The most urgent preservation works were completed by 1930. In 1975, UNESCO started an extensive program to save monuments. Since then, tourists are not allowed inside the colonnade, and even air traffic is directed away from the Acropolis. The Erechtheion is the most mysterious building in the Acropolis. It's named after King Erechtheus, who was buried there. It may also have been the location of the still undiscovered Mycenaean Palace. This could perhaps explain some unusual features of the building. We find no trace of typical Greek symmetry. The building has no main axis, but has four ground levels and three top levels. Its exteriors and column orders are also different. There's no front hall, and there's no uniform stone floor, perhaps because the builders did not wish to close off the shrines and tombs beneath the building. The famous portico on the southern side of the Erechtheion demonstrates the similarity in the proportions of ionic columns and the female body. The 2.4 meter tall slender figures called caryatids are familiar elements of archaic architecture. The Acropolis Museum, founded in 1878, was partially built underground so as not to disrupt the view of the elevated plain. Invaluable metopes, friezes, reliefs, and statue fragments are displayed here. All that has been preserved and had not been looted or carried off to museums around the world. Here we can see the single greatest collection of ancient statues which had been hidden underground following the Persian Wars. The museum's nine halls house masterpieces like the world-famous Moshephora statue and Athena fighting the Gigantes. Also noteworthy are the marble portrait of Alexander the Great and the gigantic torso of Poseidon and a large marble statue of Athena's sacred bird, the owl. The most ancient caryatid found on the Acropolis bears a pomegranate in her hand and dates from 580. Hall number four features the oldest known Greek equestrian statue, the work of Phidimus. The marble hound with its alert expression is completely true to life, and many are enchanted by the lovely Nike removing her sandal to step barefoot onto the sacrificial altar. The two tympanums from the Parthenon had been reconstructed from incomplete remains. Many parts of the puzzle are missing. These were replaced on the basis of assumption. The caryatids, with their long Doric peplums stretching over their breasts and thighs, proclaim the triumph of femininity and youth. No wonder they caught the eye of Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin. The British ambassador to Turkey collected the decaying statues on the Acropolis in 1803 and shipped them to the British Museum in London. The collection, called the Elgin Marbles, is exhibited next to the Rosetta Stone, the nose of the Sphinx, and other relics of ancient Egypt. A section of Parthenon friezes some 75 meters long is also accommodated there. The walls display metopes, sculpted rectangular panels of stone. Fifteen metopes can be found at the British Museum, one in the Louvre, and 41 are still in their original places. The remaining, rather fragmented specimens are exhibited at the Acropolis Museum and at the National Museum in Athens. In addition to the Acropolis Plateau, there's much to see on the slopes as well. As we look down the southern slope, we see the Theatre of Dionysus. It was built around 330 BC and converted several times. 
dramas, tragedies, and comedies were performed here, but it was also used for official ceremonies, and at a time the People's Assembly was also held here. To the north, we see the Agora at our feet. To the east, the columns of the Olympion and Hadrian's Arch, with the peak of Lysibetus in the background. The narrow alleys of the Placa are hidden by the houses. Only the Hephaestion stands tall among them. The western slope of the hill is the gentlest. From here, we can approach the hill of Ares. According to the myth, the god of war was tried here after having killed the son of Poseidon, and hence the name of Ariospagos. In later times, actual trials were held at this location. The judicial body was also named after the place. The trials were held on the rock plateau, one rock serving as the seat of the plaintiff, and another as the seat of the defendant. Order was maintained by Scythian archers, who had their garrison on the ridge of the hill. To the north stood the shrine of Erinnes, the underworld goddess who took revenge for murder. The original steps, carved into the rock, are still there, but they're so worn and slippery that tourists generally prefer the new metal steps. As far as the eye can see, the terraced white block houses of new Greek architecture form a solid mass. The location of the Agora, the marketplace of ancient Athens, was known as early as the 1800s. However, its excavation required the demolition of 350 buildings and some 3,000 tons of rubble were removed. The American School of Classical Studies in Athens has been unearthing and preserving the city's ancient relics since 1931. The Agora was the center of politics, trade and social life in the city-state. Offices, the court of justice, the council, the money changers, temples and other public buildings were assembled in this flat, trapezoidal area. The marketplace itself was naturally surrounded by shops and warehouses, and the workshops of artisans and tradesmen. The Stoa was a colonnaded market hall built by Atalos II, ruler of Pergamon, giving a border to the eastern side of the main square. The building, reconstructed in its original form, now houses the Agora Museum. On the mound that crowns the Agora rises the best-preserved ancient Greek temple, the Hephaestion, dedicated to the divine blacksmith of Olympus. The construction of the temple began a decade before the foundations of the Parthenon were laid. In fact, work was suspended for a time because the great temple absorbed all funds and energy. A part of the Doric columns of the Hephaestion were made of easily sculpted Paros marble and only later was the Pentelic white marble used, having been tried and tested in the building of the Parthenon. It feels strange to walk in an original Doric temple with a ceiling, the walls of the now standing firm, the metopes, reliefs and yellow thickset columns in place, which rise from the flowers circling their base just like 2,400 years ago, when the now decrepit agora was teeming with life. The area is diagonally bisected by the Panathenea, the sacred pathway which leads to the Acropolis. Of the buildings of the Agora, only the main walls remain, as new houses had been built over them. From these ruins, the archaeologists try to reconstruct what the square may have looked like before our time. The Boluterion was the city hall, where the 500 members of the council met. The small round building called the Tholos was connected to the city hall by a wide corridor and served as the seat of the Praetanion, the executive board of the council. The Metron housed the archives of the city, consisting of official documents, memorandums, contracts and deeds written on papyrus and parchment. Not much remains of the Temple of Apollo, Patros and Ares. The Altar of the Twelve Gods stood at the north side of the Agora, along the Panathenaic Way. This was considered the starting point of all roads. All distances were measured from this point. The Temple of the Holy Apostles, or Agri Apostoloi, stands on the southeastern corner of the Agora. This was the only building that was preserved when the houses were demolished to allow excavation of the Agora. The temple dates from the 11th century. 
Originally, a small shrine stood in its place, but right next to an ancient spring. The building had been rebuilt several times, and its original Byzantine shape was restored only in the 1950s. The graceful building, its base the shape of a Greek cross, is surrounded by thick walls. The exterior is ornamented by characters of the Kufic script. The cupola is supported by four Corinthian columns, the apse and the transept forming a semicircular alcove. The iconostasis on the floor are made of marble. The frescoes depict Christos Pantocrator and St. John the Baptist, and also archangels and cherubs. The paintings in the entrance area have been brought here from the nearby temple of St. Spiridion. The rails of the underground railway emerge to the surface along the north side of the Agora and run parallel with the walkway named after Hadrian's library. The railway thus crosses the Sacred Way and probably the Stoa Poikile, or famous Painted Portico. Contemporary historians wrote that this colonnade was the most beautiful one ever seen. It's being excavated by American archaeologists. The western gate of the Roman Agora was built in 10 BC and was named after Athena Archegetis. The Roman Agora lies in the Placa area. This quarter of Athens, with its archaic charm, holds narrow alleyways and a true eastern bazaar. Its mosque is one of the few surviving reminders of Turkish times, and even the bazaar itself seems a smaller sibling of the great bazaar of Istanbul. Here they sell peanuts and Greek flags, bags and t-shirts and other clothes embroidered with Greek motifs. You can also buy souvenirs and copies of Greek antiques, objects of worship, icons, old coins, CDs of original Greek music, and of course, locally produced food and drink. Corn is roasted and popped over charcoal. Take your pick of fruits, large grapes, figs and oranges, try spices and spice mixtures, olive oils and olives. The most famous Greek drinks are aniseed flavored ouzo and the famous metoxa brandy, and also retina, wine treated with pine rosin. You'll find a wide selection of these, even in decorative boxes. Some smiths and jewelers manufacture their products on the spot. The Great Metropolis Church was built around 1840 to give the capital of the newly liberated country a cathedral of fitting splendor and size. The majority of its ornaments originate from previously existing churches. It dwarfs the little Metropolis Church next to it, which dates back to the 11th century. The exteriors of both churches are decorated with Byzantine and antique symbols carved in marble. The cathedral was dedicated to the memory of Patriarch Gregorios. His marble sarcophagus lies in the cathedral, left from the entrance, and his statue stands outside in the square. The square is surrounded by Athens' most elegant pedestrian area. Here, the shops and coffee houses are westernized, with little regard for national identity. The nearby Tripodos Street was once home to Byron and Shelley. Kopnikaria Church is one of the more important Byzantine monuments in Athens. Compared to other buildings originated in the 10th and 11th century, it lies deeper below today's street level. Originally, it was symmetrical, in the shape of a Greek cross, 
and the north wing was added later. The Olympion joins Ethnikos Keros, the People's Garden, from the south. The People's Garden features an open-air exhibition of photographs of Greek monuments. The Olympion was named after Olympic Zeus. Among the remains of antique houses, we walk toward the Arch of Hadrian. This is the gateway that was built where once the wall of Theseus' city once stood. On the western side of the marble gateway, the inscription says, This is Athens, the ancient city of Theseus. On the eastern side, another inscription responds, This is the city of Hadrian and not of Theseus. The shrine of the chief deity is not the only attraction at the huge excavation site. True, its gigantic marble columns are the most prominent feature. The site is located in the valley of the Elysos River, which, in Greek mythology, was a sacred place for the Earth Mother Gaia. According to the legend, this is where the great deluge flowed into the Elysos River through a crack in the rock. It was Pesistrato's idea to erect a temple to Zeus at this spot. The Doric shrine was 107 meters long and 41 meters wide, framed by eight columns on the shorter and 21 columns on the longer side. However, history intervened and the work was disrupted. Eight columns of the semi-finished building were taken to Rome, where you can still see them in the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoleum. The Zeus Temple was finally completed in 130 AD at Hadrian's order. The building stood for some 300 years. Of its 104 columns, 15 are currently standing, but even the ones lying on the floor show its monumental size. The columns are 17.5 meters high. The capital measures 3 meters in diameter. No trace remains of Plato's Academy, where he received his disciples and where he was also buried. There's a pretty little grove at the spot, the successors of the twelve olive trees of the Academos. Branches from these trees were used to reward the winners of the Pan Athenaia celebration games. A simple stone slab east of the grove commemorates the settlement of Colonos, immortalized by its native son Sophocles in the drama Oedipus at Colonus. According to the legend, Oedipus disappeared here at the end of his life into a rock crevice. The People's Garden is a huge bright green patch in the center of the city, south of the Parliament. The park once belonged to the Royal Palace and is enclosed by three avenues bearing the names of three queens, Amelia, Olga and Sophia. In the middle of the park there stands a Zapion, the colonnaded building built by the wealthy Zappas family to house temporary exhibitions. Next to the Zapion we find the memorial of Loannis Barbakis, built in antique style and nearby the one-time palace of Heinrich Schliemann, discoverer of Troy. The parliament building, which was originally built as a royal palace, seems anachronistic in the Greek capital. It was designed by German architect Friedrich Gardner for Otto von Wittelsbach in German classicist style. The son of the most notable Bavarian ruler, Ludwig I, Otto, was king of Greece for a brief period. He was driven away by the revolutionaries, but first forced to sign the new constitution. In memory of this, the square in front of the parliament is called Syntagma, or Constitution. In the square, soldiers stand guard in shoes decorated with tassels and wearing a rather unusual uniform. The Greeks call them evzon, or handsomely belted. The change of the guard is a real tourist attraction.
If you visit Athens, we recommend visiting the peak of 277 meter tall Lycabettus Mountain on your very first day. From here, you can get an almost map like view of the entire city. You can either walk up from Syntagma Square or drive via Sophia Avenue, taking a turn at the Byzantine Museum. There's also a cogwheel railway from Odos Plutarchau on the southern slope of the hill. As you ascend the winding roads and paths on the hillside among shady trees, cypresses, and cacti, the vista opens up gradually. From the peak, the view is a delightful 360 degrees. The small chapel of St. George glows white. Its terrace offers the best view of the Acropolis, especially if you have field glasses or a telephoto lens with you. Behind the city, you can see the blue mountains of Attica, and further on, the sea, the Saronic Gulf. It's beautiful to watch the setting sun conjure a golden bridge over the water and cover the mountains in a shroud of purple. The country surrounding the capital is known as Attica and offers several scenic excursions. Marathon. The battle and the run have forever etched this name into human memory. Attica's second highest mountain is the Bentelli. Here is the source of the marble of which the Parthenon was built. Beneath the mountain's eastern slope lies the Bay of Marathon. Among the mountains and picturesque surroundings, we find Lake Marathon, a water reservoir. This artificial lake pleases the eye. But it has a much more important reason to exist. In the hilly Attica region, drinking water was always a precious commodity. This huge reservoir was built from 1926 to 1931 to satisfy the water needs of the rapidly growing capital. The battlefield itself, or rather, the memorial column marking its location, is not actually in the village of Marathon, but at the roadside a turn at the 35-kilometer sign. Only a simple Greek Orthodox chapel and a white marble column commemorate the heroes. Herodotus' detailed account of the event is corroborated by archaeological findings. The attacking Persians outnumbered the Greeks by three to one. The backbone of the Athenian army was the infantry, composed of farmers and the less wealthy groups of city dwellers called the hoplites. The battle began on a bright autumn morning in 490 BC, after two days of peaceful confrontation. The Greeks had a few archers and horsemen, but carried excellent weapons and were well trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Moreover, they were fighting for their country and their freedom, and this multiplied their strength. They defeated the Persians in a vicious battle. The surviving enemy either drowned in the swamps in flight, or ran off in desperation. Tradition has it that a hoplite soldier in full weaponry weighing 35 kilograms ran all the way to Athens to announce the victory. After having done so, he collapsed and died on the spot. Since then, marathon runs are held in memory of this event. The distance the runners covered is exactly the distance from the edge of Marathon Village to the Athens Stadium, that is, 42 kilometers and 195 meters. In Marathon Village, one such run is held annually, starting from the new stadium built next to the bridge over the river Charadra. 6,400 Persian, 192 Athenian, and 20 Plataean fighters fell in battle. The Greeks were buried in two burial mounds. The tombs were excavated by the famous Greek archaeologist Spiridon Marinatos, also known for the Akrotiri excavations on the island of Santorini. The Museum of the Battle of Marathon was built next to the burial hills. The exhibition features the objects found in the tombs of the Athenians and the Plataeans, and also findings from the Cave of Pan and the Tsepi Necropolis, mostly early Helladic pottery. Some of the base reliefs and statues date from times preceding the battle. Corinthus lies 60 kilometers west of Athens.
To save the trouble of sailing around the Peloponnesus Peninsula, a track was built in ancient times on which smaller ships were transported on horse-drawn carts between the Aegean and the Ionic Sea. A section of this 10-meter-wide stone-paved road, called Doilkos in Greek, can still be seen at the Poseidon end of the channel. The Emperor Nero had already envisaged building a channel along this route for larger ships to pass through. However, his plan wasn't realized until 1882. And that year began the construction of the Corinthian Canal, which is 6.4 kilometers long, 80 meters deep, and 23 meters wide at its narrowest point, which was completed in 1893. Today, even vessels of 10,000 tons need not sail around the peninsula anymore. The citadel of ancient Corinth, its city center with the Roman Agora, is worth a visit. However, most of this once flourishing settlement was demolished by an earthquake in 1928. There are several methods allowing bridges to open up or to twist away in order to allow the passage of ships. However, the solution applied at the Corinthian Channel is unique. Here, the bridge doesn't rise, but sinks under the water surface. When the bridge master sees a ship approaching, he sounds the gong to announce that the bridge will soon close. Once traffic has stopped, he can start the winches that lower the bridge. The ship passes and the bridge rises again, even 100 times a day if necessary. Piraeus lies 10 kilometers southwest of the center of Athens. The rocky Octi Peninsula protectively embraces a larger and a smaller bay, both ideal natural harbors. This is why Piraeus was already Athens' most important harbor in ancient times. Now it has become part of the capital. Back in the 1960s, there were fields and meadows between the two cities. But over a few decades, these gradually gave way to apartment blocks, villas, public buildings, shopping centers, and residences until the two became as one. If you're not traveling by car, you can take the metro from downtown Athens to Piraeus Harbor. In ancient time, the bays of Piraeus served as commercial and military ports. Now there's a commercial port and a ferry port for passengers, and also a marina for yachts. The harbor is used by gigantic ocean liners, ferries, and luxury passenger boats, so it's a very busy place most of the time. Regular ferries to most Greek islands leave from the southwest quay of the greater harbor. Themistocles realized that protecting the port city is crucial for Athens, and he started to build fortifications and the long wall of defense. The harbor employed thousands of people, so public building and temples were soon required. The ancient agora, or marketplace, is still there, just like the square grid street plan drawn by the genius architect Hippodamos of Miletus. Although the city was destroyed several times in the course of history, it was always reconstructed according to the original plans of the greatest ancient architect. Piraeus also has an archaeological and naval museum. Many tourists roam the winding coastal paths on the southwestern part of Octi Peninsula along the wall, enjoying the view of the sea, the islands, and the distant blue mountains. The bay was once called Zeafreatis and was used as a military port. Today, it's called Pasalimano, 
and houses white luxury yachts and private sailboats. The circular bay, protected from the winds, is carved into the east coast of the land strip and measures 400 meters in diameter. In the Middle Ages, the city was called Porto Leone, after antique marble statue of a lion at the port entrance. The statue is no longer there. It's been guarding the arsenal of Venice since 1862. The fishing port of Piraeus is located further east, in a similar circular bay. Turco Limano, at the foot of Castella Hill, is also the harbour for the sports crowd. This is where beginners are introduced to the mysteries of sailing. Life is more tranquil here, so tourists enjoy visiting the taverns and fish restaurants along the harbour. In addition to the beach, Turco Limano has a freshwater swimming pool. A new stadium and other sports facilities have been constructed nearby. Piraeus also receives ships coming in from North Africa and the Middle East, which add a real oriental flavor to the brisk trading activities in the streets. The road to Parama and Daphne is the realm of North African rug traders. Eleusis lies 22 kilometers west of the center of Athens. In ancient times, Eleusis was known for its sacred mysteries. According to the myth, Hades, lord of the underworld, abducted Persephone, daughter of Zeus and Demeter. In her grief, the mother rendered the earth infertile and set off to look for her daughter as a mere mortal. Finally, the gods agreed to a compromise. Persephone spends only one-third of the year in the underworld, and during this time, nature mourns together with Demeter. When Persephone returns, her mother covers the earth in fresh bloom and brings on spring and summer. The mystery celebrations therefore serve the cult of fertility. The sacred precinct of Eleusis existed since 1500 BC. This renowned cult center of the antique age was razed to the ground by the Persians. The ruins uncovered by 19th century excavations originate from the first century. The cult of mysteries was also popular in the Roman age, and in fact reached its peak in the times of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. At the entrance of the excavation site, we can see the remains of a temple of Artemis and two triumphal arches. The great Propylaea was the entrance to the holy inner precinct. This is where the sacred way passed. To the south, we see the Kalikoros as well. This is where Demeter came to reclaim her daughter. To the right, on the slope of the hill, gapes the cave of Pluto, believed to be the entrance to the underworld. A Panagia chapel stands at the hilltop. But the sacred way doesn't lead there, but to the Telesterion, where the actual celebrations were held, only for the eyes of the initiated. The covered hall measuring about 50 by 50 meters, its roof supported by 42 columns, could house 3,000 people. The center of the hall was occupied by the Shrine of Demeter. From the remaining wall stumps and column bases, we can see the original plan and the later Roman additions. The rock terrace carved into the hillside gives a good overview of the entire ruined complex. At the Eleusis Museum, 
Ovid's words, etched into marble, evoke the antique atmosphere. Hard by Hymettus's gaily flowered mount, mid soft green turf there springs a sacred fount. Girt with low trees, the sward with arboot laid, bay, rosemary, and dark myrtle scent the glade. While dense-leaved box abounds and clover fine, and fragile tamarisk and graceful pine. At 1,415 meters, Parnes is the highest peak in Attica. In the towns of Akami and Matoki, along the road that winds up the mountain, tourism is the main source of income today. The attractive open-air restaurants are frequented by Athenians too. The Agia Trias resort beneath the peak is accessible by road, but it's easier to take the cable car. The cable car system was built in 1971, and then completely rebuilt in 2000. The departure hall is lavish enough, with its spiral staircase and state-of-the-art chandelier. But at the peak station, the visitor actually steps right into a luxury casino. The green slopes of the Parnes are easy to recognize amidst the other mostly bare and yellowish-brown mountains. There's little water and the rock is mainly limestone. The mountains hold lots of marble and other valuable materials. In ancient times, Lorien was known for its rich silver mine. In the smaller valleys, olive groves are interspersed with orchards of grapes, oranges, lemons, and figs. Cereals produced include wheat, barley, rye, maize, and rice. Scented herbs often grow wild in fields and at the roadside. On the rocks, Mediterranean plants grow among the thistles. Agave, aloe vera, and frigana. Goats, sheep, and donkeys graze in the meadows. Use of the cable car is free of charge. This is the casino's gift to prospective customers. However, many won't spend money at the tables, being content to enjoy the fantastic view. The Parnes is surrounded on three sides by tall mountains, and only towards the south do we have an open view of the sea. We can see the island of Salamis, famous for another ancient battle. As at Marathon, the Greeks faced a Persian force far superior in numbers. However, this was a maritime battle. The story is told by Aeschylus in his tragedy, The Persians. Athens Beach Vacation Resort begins at some 10 kilometers from the Olympion. The section of the Saronic Gulf between Athens and Cape Sunion was called Coast of Apollo. There were many important settlements here, for example, Agios Kosmas. After that, the place fell into deep slumber and was repopulated only from 1922 when thousands of Greeks left Asia Minor and settled here. However, real growth had to wait until the advent of mass tourism. Since then, the area has come to be known as Attica's Riviera. Tourists swarmed the Peleon Foliron, Kalimaki, and Varkiza. New and increasingly sophisticated hotels are cropping up along the jagged coastline with its sandy and rocky beaches, and they inevitably promote the development of the area. Hotels are followed by well-equipped beach facilities, restaurants, taverns, gift shops, nightclubs, casinos, golf courses, and sports facilities. The Glyfada area is especially rich in hillside villas and holiday homes. Its beach, austere beach, is the best on the coast. Close to the town, we find the two airports that serve Athens. 
Alinikon, and the West Terminal. The name Voliagmeni means sunken. The town took its name in ancient times from a small lake wedged between precipitous rocks. Its sulfurous water, fed by warm underground currents, is used for medicinal purposes. Almost every Greek coastal town has a fish market. Sometimes it's found next to the vegetable and meat market, but more often in the harbor. The Glyphada market is one of the latter type, where the produce of the sea is sold straight from the boat. The catch is so fresh it wiggles. There are tunas, cods, mullets, halibuts, and sharks. Tiny sardines are netted in bulk, but the nets also trap squids and octopi. Both are popular in Greek cuisine, just like shrimp and other shellfish. Seafood is prepared as soup or as a starter, warm or cold, and it's grilled or made into pita filling or as a salad as well. Squid rings are delicious fried in batter, and octopus is often served in a fresh tomato sauce. Clams and shrimp tails are often used in salads. The wild romance of the rocky coastline between Kalamaki and Glyfrada rivals the beauty of the Greek islands. The hotels lining the beach are cheaper than in downtown Athens, and it's easy to get around either by car or by public transportation. Sunion, commemorated in Homer's Odyssey, is at the southern tip of the Attica Peninsula. Whether approached from the road or by sea, the Sonion Acropolis immediately catches the eye. At 70 meters above sea level and with the columns of the Temple of Poseidon at the top. The small round bay, where vacationers' boats sway gently now, used to harbor battleships, and on the rock above, a fort was built in 400 BC to watch over the entrance of the Saronic Gulf. The coast is lined with authentic Greek taverns. The porches are shaded by climbing grapevine. The furniture is simple, straw woven chairs, the tables covered in blue and white. Entertainment is provided by the ever-changing sea, and the tavern cooks tempt you with delightful aromas and flavors. The menu is not very extensive. The food is simple but exceptionally delicious. The secret is the freshness of the ingredients. Freshly caught fish, grilled on charcoal and sprinkled with the juice of a lemon picked in the backyard. Served with a country salad, or horiatiki, topped with white feta cheese and golden olive oil. It's best to wash it down with some local wine. You can still see about 500 meters of the old fort's semicircular wall, which is 3.5 meters thick. At one time, watchtowers jutted out of the wall at 20 meter intervals. They're gone with hardly a trace, just like Athena's shrine, of which only the wall foundations remain. But of the 34 marble columns of the Poseidon Temple, measuring 30 by 14 meters, 19 have withstood the siege of the centuries. Many have written about this legendary place. According to the saga Aegeus, after whom the Aegean Sea is named, stood here, on the cliff of Sonion, waiting for his son Theseus to return from Crete. The young hero had promised that if he defeated the Minotaur, he would change the black sails of his ship to white. Sadly, he forgot his promise, and his father threw himself off the cliff in despair. The small plateau teems with tourists every evening, marveling at the sun setting on the Aegean Sea. First, the color of the sea darkens, then the sun robs the columns of their golden glow, the horizon grows hazy, and the water acquires an opalescent glimmer. Helios, from his sinking chariot, sends a last ray that covers the pearly back of the sea in purple and gold.
those unwilling to go to the end of the Attican Peninsula can enjoy the incomparable sunset over the Saronic Gulf from Athens itself. Like a Betis hill towers so high above the city that from here even the Acropolis seems tiny, and in the background the clouds put on a new show every day. As the sun descends, so should we, because this is the time when the Plaka comes to life. The Plaka is a quarter of Athens wedged between Odos Armu and the northeastern slope of the Acropolis. This is the most lively and most attractive part of modern Athens. When it was suggested that the old blocks of Plaka should be demolished to allow excavation of the ancient ruins underneath, the mayor of Athens objected. We have plenty of ruins, but the Plaka is unique, he said. The area joining the slope of the Acropolis is uneven. Its levels and streets are connected by winding passages and alleys broken by steps. The buildings are mostly townhouses built in the mid-19th century, with reflections to German architectural classicism. As other parts of the city are dominated by terraced white blocks in the Neo-Grecian style, the Plaka's houses are the only reminders of the time of the Bavarian king. The Plaka today is a full-fledged tourist attraction, thick with taverns and loud with bouzouki music. Some sneer at its raucous fake ethnicity, but the majority see it as a manifestation of the Greek joie de vivre and Mediterranean temperament. Either way, you can spend a fun evening strolling along its shopping streets and having a Greek-style dinner at one of the taverns. In addition to the ubiquitous gyros, the average tourist may be familiar with souvlaki, dolmadis, and moussaka, but Greek cuisine has more to offer. As in other countries in the Mediterranean zone, beef and poultry are prevalent, and especially lamb, which the Greeks prepare in great variety and deliciously seasoned. You may start dinner with a salad of fresh vegetables, served with tzatziki, yogurt, and cucumber with garlic. Meat is usually grilled in slices or on skewers. The Greeks also eat a lot of fish. Fish is often grilled on charcoal. Soups are not as common as in other European countries, but the avgalimono, a kind of chicken soup with egg and lemon, and the Greek tomato soup are definitely worth a try. Many kinds of vegetables are grown and cooked in various ways, and frequently made into casseroles. Dishes are served with flat pita bread, or yellow bread sprinkled with sesame seeds. Desserts are usually very sweet and oriental in character. Those who drink neither wine nor beer may finish the meal with a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice. The Roman Agora or Forum, measuring 100 by 100 meters, is located in the Plaka area, west of the Tower of Winds, and close to Hadrian's Library. At its construction, it had two gates, and the entire square was surrounded by double-naved porticos supported by ionic columns. Excavation uncovered the remains of the gates and of the porticos, which once boasted mosaic decorations. The octagonal white marble Tower of the Winds is an almost perfectly preserved relic of Roman times, while the mosque in the bazaar bears witness to the Turkish age. The city of Athens has a long and varied history, but even in the 21st century, it's the mythology and the remains of ancient Hellas that attracted tourists to this sun-drenched land. Music